Good morning, folks. Welcome to a Advanced Hour Chemistry. Welcome back to Advanced Hour Chemistry, probably. We are doing answers today. This is the 2019 Advanced Hire paper. And I'm going to run through the answers to the multiple choice. I know you can get the answers online, but it doesn't explain why. And hopefully I may be able to point you in a direction of a few exam shortcuts and techniques. So let's have a look here. Oh, by the way, I haven't cheated in advance. I do have the official answers, and I'll, there's a fair chance I'll manage to make a mistake in some of these. And I get to catch myself out, but you'll see why I made the mistakes, hopefully, as well. Other than incompetence, of course. Right, get to it here. Emission spectrum, which means energy is being released. So we're on these two answers here straight away. Uh, the line at 310 nanometers, that is not something we can see. It's too short a wavelength, which means it's up past the ultraviolet. So we're talking about B. Now, number two, um, which the following changes would heating to constant mass allow the mass of the water produced to be determined? So this is a gravimetric analysis question. Where could you use gravimetric analysis for these reactions? Is that what they're asking? Must be. You can use it for gases, that's for damn sure. Um... Well, sorry, I've misread that question. In which the following changes would heating to constant mass allow the mass of water produced to be determined? No, it is a gravimetric analysis. Yeah, these are just chemical reactions. That is the one where we have 10 waters trapped inside our sodium carbonate matrix, and now they're released. Technically speaking, shouldn't that be gas? Anyway, I'm going to go with D. Number three. I have to try readjusting my filming as well because we're closer up, so hopefully you can see the questions. Number three, in which of, which of the following reagents would be most, just means chemicals, would be most suitable for the gravimetric determination of magnesium ions in water? Right, okay, so it's precipitation. Uh, I've got a calculator. I uh, might have to go and fish out a data book. Um, magnesium ions. So we want a solid precipitate of the magnesium ions. Which of these counter ions would magnesium precipitate with? Well, it won't precipitate with nitrate because nitrate is soluble for everything as far as I know. So magnesium carbonate and magnesium carbonate, interestingly, we apparently have two right answers. So there must be something wrong with one of these two. Well, let me go and get a data book and I'll check. Okay, as I unprofessionally rustle the data book in your ear. What do we have here? Sodium carbonate and silver carbonate. I'm actually pretending that I don't know for this because I know what the answer is just from having done chemistry for a million years. Um, sodium, am I on the screen? Yes, I am. Sodium carbonate is nice and soluble, but silver carbonate, whoops, isn't. Which means you can't mix a solution. Tell me rustly, sorry. You can't mix a solution of silver carbonate with the, mag the, with the water because this doesn't dissolve. So it's C. Number four. Hoon's rule, straightforward KU, maximum multiplicity, it's just uh, that one. You just need to know it. There's nothing to be involved in figuring that one out. Number five, which of the following molecules contain the smallest bond angle? Uh, now, the small bond angles are caused by having multiple non-bonded pairs of electrons because they don't play well with each other and they squash the existing bonds in towards each other thus reducing this angle here. So we're going to have to run through these. BeCl2. Beryllium is group 2. So two outer electrons, two things bonded to it. That's just linear. Well, that's not the smallest bond angle. That's for damn sure. It's 180 degrees. BeCl3. I'm cheating because I know it's flat and it's planar, but you can use the same approach. It's the VSEPR theory. That's 120 degrees. That's 180 degrees. We're getting better. CCL4 is 109 degrees because uh, it's tetrahedral. Uh, PCL5. So that's 109 uh, degrees. PCL phosphorus is group 5. Um, so there's five outer electrons. It's got five things bonded to it, all over two. That's uh, five pairs of electrons. That's an unusual setup. That's one in the axial, two in the axial, and three in the equatorial set up. So 120 degrees here, but only 90 degrees there. So it's, I'm going to go with that one. The smallest bond angle. It was nothing to do with the non-bonded pairs of electrons. Ha! Got caught out trying to be smart. Number six, iron forms iron two and iron three. Which of the following statements is correct? Uh, I can just feel a headache coming on. This is going to be a lot of work for one mark. Iron two ions. So iron two and iron three ions. 
let's get the basics set up. Iron is basically argon, and then it used to be uh, 4S2, the audio is funny because I'm looking at the periodic table on my wall here. 4S2, 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So an iron atom would be 4S2, 3D, 6. Iron 2 will have none of them. And iron 3 will have 3D, 5. More occupied energy levels than iron 3s. Nah, rubbish. They're both the same. Iron 2s have more unpaired electrons than iron 3s. So iron 2... We're still on camera? Just about. Iron 2 is 3D6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's got four unpaired electrons. Iron 3 is 3D5. So we'll actually have... Iron 3 will have all of these unpaired, which is the other way around to that. So that's not true. Iron 3 ions are a better reducing agent than iron 2 ions. Not sure. Let's come back to that one. Iron 3 ions are more stable than iron 2 ions. Maybe because there's the old half-filled orbital thing being more stable. Possibly. Let's check that out. Iron 3 ions are a better reducing agent. In other words, they themselves want to be oxidized. That would make it iron... Four. Hmm. Honestly, not sure about this one. Tempted to go with this one on the half-filled orbital, half orbital basis. Maybe we'll come back to that one at the end. This is what I would do if it was my exam. Which metal in the following ions has the highest oxidation state? These questions are killing me for one mark each. There, is there a shortcut for this? Not really. Ten is four, obviously. This is... Um, Vanadium plus uh, 2 minus equals 2 plus. So vanadium is 4 as well. Manganese, the, um, sorry, permanganate. I, I'm going to cheat. I just know that one from having done this a million times, but you'd have to do the same approach. That's 7 plus. Cr2072, I can't actually remember that one. Really can't remember that one. So it's there are two chromiums plus 7 lots of negative 2 equals negative 2. That charge there. So that becomes um, 14. Take it over here. It's positive 14, which becomes 12. So two chromiums are 12. Chromium is plus 6. So it's permanganate, which I did actually suspect, but didn't want to jump to that conclusion. And now uh, what we've got? Number 8. Copper complex is a green food colouring. Which line in the table is correct for the complex? Right. Coordination number, classification of ligands. Coordination number is... Um, easy. Draw a circle around the metal. How many bonds do you cut? Four. So it's these two. Monodentate, tetrodentate, the ligand. That's the biting points this ligand has got. Now, how many ligands are here? This whole thing is just one ligand with four attachment points. So in fact, it's D. If you'd had two separate ligands, each with two attachment points, it oh, sorry, four separate ligands, um, it would have been C. Which of the following changes will cause the equilibrium constant to increase? Trick question. Uh, only temperature, which means we're talking about these two. Now, increase, which means we want to drive the equilibrium this way because you get more of the right-hand side. And we find the delta H, which they always give you for left to right, is exothermic. So if you want to go this way some more, you're going to have to turn the temperature down. So it's a decrease in temperature. If that had been positive, an increase in temperature would drive it this way. Um, making a bit more progress now. How are we doing for time? It's quarter past nine in Melbourne Academy. And we're doing good. Following graph shows a variation with delta G, which predicts feasibility with temperature for a given reaction, which of the statements is true. For it to be feasible, delta G is to be negative, which we're seeing is in this region of the graph. So that's rubbish, that's rubbish. Above 300 Kelvin? Yeah, that's the answer. Nice and easy, if you know what delta G means. Number 11. Iron can be reduced using hydrogen. The enthalpy change for the reduction of iron 3 oxide. Uh, so we just want the enthalpy change, which is the sum of all of these minus all of these added together. 
So we need two lots of, um, it's, the re it's the products minus the reactants, by the way, it's in the data book and the equations page. So we're going to have two lots of zero plus um, three lots of H2O, three lots of negative 242. Take away, are we still on camera? Yes, we are. Take away an, a negative 822 for this and three lots of hydrogen, which is also, oh, okay, fine, nice and simple. Had to steal a calculator for this one. What we got, we got three lots of negative 242. Take away 822, negative. Gives us 96, nice and easy, see. Number 12. Which line on the table is correct for water condensing? So turning from a gas to a liquid. Now, I do delta S first, personally, because we are becoming more ordered. So there is a drop in entropy, which means we're talking about these two answers. And delta H, slightly counterintuitively, for condensing water, that is a, an exothermic process. One of the reasons that steam is so dangerous for giving you burns because it dumps, not only is it very, very hot, but it dumps all the energy out onto the surface as it condenses. So it's uh, B, in fact. If you're having problems wrapping your head around that, I think about it being the opposite of boiling. If you want to boil a liquid, you've got to put the energy in. Number 13, rate. Are we just on camera? Yes, we are. Uh, X plus two, I'm excited. Now, what's going on here? From reaction one to two, we have doubled x, we have had a no effect on y, and we have doubled the rate. So that means it is first order with respect to x. And have we changed the y? Uh, yeah, between experiments one and three. We've kept x the same, and this time we've halved y. What have we done to the reaction speed? Not a sausage. So therefore it is zero order with respect to y. So simply that. Number 14, the rate of chemical reaction is second order overall. Now, oh, I remember a pupil asked me about this. This, frankly, is really naughty. It's a poor question at SQA from 2019. If anybody's listening, you should feel seriously ashamed of yourself. You're making a massive assumption here. You're making the assumption that the rate was measured in moles per litre per second. So that's the equation for the rate. Sorry, that's the units for the rate. Those are the units for the rate. And you're also making the assumption that concentration is in moles per litre, and that's more forgivable. But this could be measured in all sorts of ways. It could be centimetres cubed per second. So somebody needs a, a smack for this one. Anyway, K is equal to rate over the concentration of your chemical X, and it's second order, so <clears throat> that would be squared which means we've got moles per litre per second on the top line. Bottom line is moles squared per litre squared. So that's moles per litre squared. I'm <clears throat> too thick to be able to deal with this in my head, so I think what we'll do is take everything up to the top line, and then I like to cancel them all out together. So moles per litre per second. Moles to the minus two now. Litres to the plus two. Let's combine that with that. Let's combine that with that, and that just sits by itself, which gives us moles to the minus one, liters to the plus one, seconds to the minus one, which is B. Moving into the world of organic from physical chemistry here. <clears throat> now, this has been my colleague's, Miss McLeod's uh, area of expertise this year, so it's quite likely I might screw something up here. The structure of two furano nitrile is shown below the number of pi bonds. Now, there's one pi bond here, there's another pi bond here, and there are two pi bonds here, so I'm going to go with a four on that one. I may stand to be wrong. The structure of one form of vitamin B3 is shown here. Oh, skeletal formula into normal formula, right, molecular formula. This is one of their favourite ones. They're Expecting you to know that there's an H on there, there, there. There's no H on there. 
Uh, there's no H on there. Am I doing that correctly? Yeah, I think so. So C67, so it's these two we're talking about. H12345, yeah, O2 and N. I'm gonna go with, yep, that one there. Of course, to put H6 in, with some people assuming this structure will just be, I don't know, I don't know what they're assuming actually. They're probably trying to trick you into thinking there's an H there and there's not. So I'm gonna go with C. Which of the compound exhibits geometric isomerism? You've got to have two different things. I see things. Substituents on each end of the branches here. You can't have identical things there. Sorry for swearing at you. So that's out because of the two H's. That is out because of the two CH3's. This is a possibility. And that's out because of two H's. C. Number 18, <clears throat> systematic name of this molecule. All right, for starters, it's cis, <clears throat> excuse me, I might need to go and get myself a glass, a glass of water. Okay, one glass of H2O later. Systematic name of the molecule shown, well, it's cis, which means we're talking this or this. The reason I know it's cis is because these two are on the same side as each other. 3,4-dimethylhex-3-ene or 2,3-dimethyl-butyl-2-ene. Ah, okay. Let's follow the old rules all the way back from National 5. The longest chain of carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's the hex one, basically. So it's this one. Now, number 19, um, isomeric amines. Trimethylamine, or methylamine, if you're a Breaking Bad fan. Trimethylamine or ethyl methyl amine. Which line in the table is correct for the tertiary compared to the secondary? Right, well, for, straight away, this has an NH bond, which means this can do hydrogen bonding. So therefore, this will have the highest boiling point. Now it becomes an English language interpretation. Try methylamine compared to ethyl. Oh, thank you, Tanoi. Good timing. Mr. Jarvie being immortalized on YouTube there. So the boiling point of trimethylamine will be lower when compared to ethyl, the secondary one. So it's actually going to be these two. This is more of a language thing. Solubility in water. Uh, this, because it's got hydrogen bonding, is more soluble. So therefore trimethylamine, the tertiary one, is going to be less soluble compared to the secondary one. Wrapping my head around the linguistics here, it's D. 20, the reaction of butanone. Lithium aluminum hydride, straight away, that's a reducing agent and you've got one of the ketones, so you're going backwards along the oxidation chain, which means you'll produce an alcohol. There are two alcohols here. It's got to be the secondary one because you had a ketone. So it's B. 21, we're just on camera there. Which line is correct for the types of reaction taking place at steps one, two, and three? Grand. Okay. Benzene only does electrophilic as substitution reactions. Does that help us? A bit. Because we're dealing with B or C. Step two, turning NO2 into NH2. I'm going to go with reduction. That's an unusual one, though. That's a very unusual one. It's not really part of the course anymore. It's a bit naughty of them to ask it, so let's check and see from your point of view if you'd know any more from step three. Step three. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I'm going to go with C. Just thinking that one through there. You have made the amide from that. Yes, that's a condensation reaction because you're joining two molecules together to make a bigger one. That's extra evidence for this. It's just that that's quite naughty. I suppose you could look at it from changing the oxygen to hydrogen ratio. Yeah, that would be the way around about it, wouldn't it? Because you've dropped the oxygen and replaced it with hydrogen. That's why it's reduction. Sorry, that took me quite a long time to just justify that answer there. 22 carboxylic acids can be prepared in different ways. 
uh, carboxylic acid in a single reaction. Addition to an alkene. Mm. Hydrolysis of a nitrile. Yeah, that sounds a possible. Reduction of an aldehyde. No, that's rubbish. That turns it into an alcohol. Substitution of a halo alkene. No, you can't substitute that. Directly. Yep, it's that one. It's just 23, we're nearly done. Um, a student attempted to predict the mass spectrum of propanone. The predicted spectrum is shown below. Double bond O, CH3, CH3. The actual mass spectrum propanone only contains three main peaks, which would not appear in the actual mass spectrum. Well, overall, C3H6O, so 36 plus 6 is 42, uh, 52, 58 is the GFM, so certainly that one will appear. 15 certainly will appear, because that's a little CH3 unit, 12 and 3 is 15. 30? What about that put together? What would that be? So 12, 24... Um, 34, 43, 43 is that one, so 30, nope, it's B, that's your answer, that would not appear, it's not one of these chunks, that would be the two CH3s put together, that's a different molecule entirely. 24, <clears throat> analysis of compound by the following percentage by mass, ah, empirical formula, I detest empirical formula. If anybody from the SQA is listening, not only did you get a smack earlier on for that assumption, please take this stupid bit of chemistry out of the course. Nobody does empirical formula in the 20th, 20th century, never mind the 21st. So, 80H, 9.5, 80, oxygen, 10.7. Let's just turn the percentages into grams, divide them all by their GFMs, and then we'll divide by the smallest number to try and get our empirical formula. 80 over 12 is, so that's C6.6667, H9.3, obviously, and oxygen. Are we still on camera? Yes, we are. 10.7 over 16. Oxygen is 0 0.668. So divide them all by 0 0.668. 6.667 divided by 0 0.6. That's going to come out to be 10, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Mentos arithmetic shortcut. It's 10, so the answer uh, must be A. Somebody's very excited outside at kicking a ball around. How to keep them happy, eh? Number 25. Which of the following splitting patterns would be observed for the circled atom in the high-resolution NMR spectrum of ethanol? Right, so uh, these atoms, these hydrogen atoms here, have got none on this side, and they have three on this side, so it's the N plus one rule, where N is the number of hydrogens on the neighbouring carbon atoms. So it's going to be four. So it's a quartet. It's C. 26. And this looks like pharmaceutical chemistry. Acts like a natural compound in the body. It's been a long time since I taught this. Hold on two seconds. So, Pramipixel, Pramipixel, however you pronounce that, does the same job as a chemical in the body. And I'm going to guess, yeah, whereas the other one, this one here, I'm not going to pronounce that, um, produces less of a response. So that means this one here is an agonist and this one here is an antagonist. Let's just find that answer, B. I'm hoping that's right, otherwise I'll be embarrassed. Human nose can detect the gas hydrogen sulfide at levels of 0 0.03 ppm. I hate this. Third time, SQA, stop using ppm. If a person inhales 6 litres of air per minute containing 0 0.03 ppm of hydrogen sulfide, <clears throat> Now, it's regarded as, is it, I'm going to literally have to go and check the definition of PPM. I think it's one milligram per kilogram, if I remember correctly. So we're talking about, oh, th this is a volume. So it's one milligram per, oh, I'm going to have to go and check this up. I'm going to come back to this one. 
Let's do one that's a proper question instead. Which of the following techniques could be used to purify purification an impure solid of caffeine that's or organic? So, therefore, it's recrystallization. That's nice and easy. 2 for 29. Yes, we do. <clears throat> 29. Equilibrium. K is 4 for this equilibrium here when you distribute X between dichloromethane and water. In the diagrams below, the number of dots represent the relative distributions. Let's count the dots, shall we, children? You need four times as many dots in this layer as this layer. So that one's out. Uh, also density. Uh, water is less dense than dichloromethane. So that one's out. Uh, so that one's out as well. For the same logic as density. It's got to be that one. It's D. Not even going to count the dots. It's not worth my time or voice. Complexometric titration. That's used to determine uh, m uh, metal ions. So it's not... Hmm. Chloride ions in seawater. Calcium ions in milk. You can't, complex, you can't complex chloride ions. It's calcium ions. I did say that metal ions to start with. Do I have time? Can I be bothered doing this PPM one? Yeah, I refuse to be beaten. Excuse me for just two seconds. Ah, right, this gets an old man's sigh, this question. PPM is defined as either at one milligram per kilogram, or in this case we're talking about a volume, so it's one milligram per litre. That's the definition of PPM. And they're saying six litres of air per minute containing 0 0.03 ppm hydrogen sulphide. So that means they've inhaled 60 litres of air. So there's 60 litres. And each litre contains... Sorry, there's 0 0.03 uh, milligrams in each litre. They've inhaled 60 litres of them. So I'm going to go with 1.8, and it's 1.8 milligrams. So I'm going to go with D. Let's see if I was right. I'll be embarrassing if I'm wrong. What number is that? Seven. D. I was right. Okay. Uh, we have time to actually check my answers to get to see if I've screwed anything up. Hang on. Do you know what? I'm going to end the video there. Uh, I'm going to pause the video there, rather, and I'm going to unpause it. If I have screwed any of these up, I, I may be back with you. Thanks for listening. Otherwise, haha. -ha. Okay, screw up number one. 16. It's supposed to be A. So I counted wrongly, apparently. Oh, I did see 6H6 for benzene. What a daft old fool. Of course, one of the carbons has been replaced by nitrogen. Ha ha, you caught me. Let's see if I made any more screw-ups. Mistake number two, 26. I got that wrong. I read that as being an antagonist. And they're both agonists. Sloppy hay. I should have looked for a better definition of where it blocks the human body's responses. Stimulates receptors. Yeah, I fell into less of a response. It's still stimulating the receptors. It's not blocking them. Do Sorry about that. Any more? 27, D, 28, C, 29, D, and 38. Thank you for listening, folks. Hopefully this has been of some use. Bye-bye.